afternoon a warm welcome to all of you um professor karuna mantena uh, is here with us uh, may i invite her to to the dais and professor kalash head of the department of political science a warm welcome to everyone here professor karuna mantena Professor Kalash, students, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, gives me immense joy in inviting uh, you all to listen to the third um, in the series, um, a Golden Jubilee Distinguished Lecture, uh, the School of Social Sciences. someone asked me the other day whether my speech for welcome speech for the talks will change or will it remain the same uh, so i said it will remain the same except that i will shuffle sentences and words um, on and off so um but it's it sometimes repetition is important uh, um, very very important and i want to repeat that the school of social sciences has has stood for truth civility goodness decency courage and intellectual endeavor for all these 50 years and in doing so it has lent credibility visibility and relevance to this university and i think that's a fantastic achievement which the school of social sciences can be very proud of and i think i think um, i'm especially uh, very very grateful uh, for professor mantena to be here this afternoon I warmly welcome her on behalf of the school of social sciences and the university and i now hand over the proceedings to professor kalash who will introduce the speaker and then chair the talk professor kalash Uh, good afternoon everyone welcome to the golden jubilee lecture series today it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker professor karuna mantena is a professor of political science at columbia university and co-director of the conference for the study of social and political thought before joining columbia she was with the department of political science at yale university and the government department at cornell Professor Mantena studied at Essex University and the London School of Economics and received her PhD from Harvard University in 2004. Professor Mantena specializes in political theory with research interests in theory and the history of the empire, South Asian intellectual history and post-colonial democracy. Professor Mantena has received numerous honors and awards including the Elizabeth Adisesha Award the Balsan Skinner Fellowship, the Gardis Smith International Book Prize, and the Senator Charles Summer Prize for the Best Dissertation at Harvard. More recently, she received the Infosys Prize 2023 in Social Sciences for her research on political ideas and practice. As we shall see shortly, her work examines how crisis fuels ideas and theories and how they inform and are transformed through political practice. In her book Alibis of the Empire Henry Main and the Ends of Liberal Imperialism she analyzes how the revolt of 1857 created an epistemic crisis for British liberalism and the theory and practice of imperial rule today she will examine another moment of theory building Gandhi's nonviolence in the context of nationalism and colonialism ladies and gentlemen please join me in welcoming professor Karuna Mantena May I now request Professor Mantena to deliver the School of Social Science Institution of Eminence Golden Jubilee Distinguished Lecture Scaling Up Satyagraha Miscalculations and Discoveries Professor Mantena Sorry I just want to make sure I stay within time <laughs> So thank you so much um let me start by thanking 
papers. Sorry. Thank you. Um, let me start by thanking uh, Dean Sharma and Professor Kailash and also um, an old friend, Professor Katju, for inviting me to speak in this um, extraordinarily uh, wonderful series celebrating 50, 50 years of the university. It's truly an honor. Uh, I was born in Hyderabad, also 50 years ago, so that's a good coincidence. <laughs> so with that, I'll start. Um, the, so uh, the period beginning with uh, the Rowlet Satyagraha of 1919 and culminating in the non-cooperation movement of 1920-1922 marked a major extension in the theory and practice of Satyagraha. It was a moment in which satyagraha became mass politics. It was in the context of these experiments in mass satyagraha that Gandhi would emerge, of course, as the leader of the nationalist movement. More crucially for my interest, this was also a moment, uh, a momentous, uh, this momentous period of mass mobilization was also one of, uh, I would argue, the densest moments of accelerated conceptual innovation in Gandhi's long career. New forms of satyagraha were tried and tested. In Gandhi's words, quote, as satyagraha was being brought into play on a large scale on the political field for the first time, he was ever making new discoveries. In this period, Gandhi filled out the main branches of what would become the tree of satyagraha. By this time, 1919, the roots of the tree had been enumbrated. They were satya, truth, and ahimsa, nonviolence. The branches of the tree, the three primary forms of satyagraha would become civil disobedience, non-cooperation, and constructive satyagraha. What I want to explore today is how these, these conceptual, these key conceptual developments, especially innovations in the theory and practice of civil disobedience and non-cooperation were directly spurred by a series of glaring failures namely the tendency of mass nonviolent politics to spark, devolve, and mutate into violence. The violence at Chauri Chora, which dramatically brought non-cooperation to an end, is well known, and it has sparked long debate and criticism, especially for Marxists, of Gandhi's commitment to mass politics. But remember, the Rowlett campaign itself also ended in, an outbreaks, in outbreaks of violence. And it was not just the violence of repression, which was on full display in the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, which erupted just a week after the launching of Rowlett. But from the standpoint of Satyagraha, much more troubling was the violence undertaken by Gandhi's supporters and sympathizers. In the case of Rowlett, these were the riots in Gujarat and Bombay, incidents of arson, looting, and attacks on civilians, in the wake of which Gandhi suspended civil disobedience the civil disobedience component of his first Satyagraha campaign within just two weeks of its jubilant inauguration. Gandhi famously called these crises his Himalayan miscalculations and halted the campaigns to retrace his steps. Miscalculations uh, were moments of reckoning in which Gandhi announced new discoveries, new understandings of the nature of both mass politics and Satyagraha, which in turn sparked theoretical and practical innovation, correction, and refinement. I want to suggest that the first nationwide satyagraha inaugurated an ongoing and persistent dilemma for Gandhian politics, that scaling up satyagraha car carried within it the ever-present potential of violence. I think it's not an exaggeration to say it was a kind of existential crisis. If Gandhi could not find a way to engage in large-scale satyagraha without violence, he would have to give up either on satyagraha or mass politics or both. How Gandhi navigated a way out of this dilemma and crisis will be the heart of my discussion today. He did so firstly by developing alternative forms of satyagraha. Secondly, he contemplated ways to better structure and delimit, constrain experiments in mass civil disobedience, both of which required a serious reckoning with the sources of violence in mass politics and, and, and a need to devise practical frameworks to forestall such outcomes. So why is this important? I think for one, we are still living in an age, maybe even more so than Gandhi's own time of mass protest. Gandhi's diagnosis was prescient. 
in, in foregrounding some of the possibilities as well as the perils of mass politics. Secondly, I want to suggest that how Gandhi reckoned with failure also tells us something very important about how to read Gandhi, understand Gandhi as a political thinker, and to understand his deepest political insights. There are, I think, two, maybe more, but two general tendencies in how we often teach and read Gandhi, especially maybe in political philosophy, uh, that have made it difficult to really mark developments in Gandhi's ideas. Especially, especially I think, the idea that, uh, of tracking a kind of conceptual evolution in the theory and practice of Satyagraha. Political philosophers especially tend to focus on textual uh, exposition, and the text that takes pride of place in Gandhi's corpus is, of course, Hind Swaraj. And sometimes some discussions have turned to the other, maybe now uh, two other centerpieces would be the autobiography, and now maybe more to the discussion and translations that he made of the Gita. Some earlier work, I think, especially focused on tracing the origins of his ideas and moral commitments, in, for example, the connections to Victorian critics such as Tolstoy, Thoreau, and Ruskin. Now, Hinsraj is without doubt, I think, still the most, uh, most important single statement of Gandhi's political philosophy. And, and, and in form, it's the closest analog to a classical political treatise. But it, it is also an unusual and precocious text. It's written in 1909, written with little direct experience in Indian politics and a full decade before embarking on these first national mobilizations against British rule. And most notably, in, in Himsraj, there's no real discussion of the logic or form of civil disobedience, non-cooperation, or the constructive program. Uh, and uh, secondly, whether one locates Gandhi's core ideas and commitments in Himsraj, the Gita, or in connection to various texts of Victorian radicalism, there is a tendency to still see Satyagraha as the direct application of these ideas and pre-existing commitments. That Satyagraha once invented in South Africa is basically seen as fully formed or almost complete and was simply applied on a much expanded scale in India. South Africa certainly served as an incubator, incubator of tactics, vocabulary, and ideas that would continue to be central to Satyagraha, but in actual fact, many of the ideas were intimated and but left underdeveloped. Again, in, in Gandhi's time in South Africa, there's no mention or the real theorization of non-cooperation or a constructive program. Most striking is the total absence of the terminology of ahimsa or nonviolence itself, which is a term Gandhi doesn't really develop until 1917 as a core foundational concept as part of the roots, root of the tree of Satyagraha until 1917. So I think there is often a assumption of continuity and completeness of Gandhi's ideas. But I think a better way to read Gandhi uh, and to understand Satyagraha is to see Satyagraha as an evolving experiment that took shape over the course of four decades of intense political activity. In Satyagraha's development, Gandhi was, in fact, generating theory through practice. The way Gandhi theorized was, I think, in and through action. Often innovations in action preceded conceptual naming and the theoretical elaboration. The classic case of this was the invention of Satyagraha itself which I will return to in a moment. Moreover, it was within moments of crisis that Gandhi's theoretical innovations occurred. He often called them in his early days epiphanies and discoveries. In these moments, Gandhi's moral commitments and philosophical ideas came into play, but the engine of innovation was political. When Gandhi came up against a political impasse, sharp criticism, or an acute crisis. I'll briefly note two such moments and then return to my main focus, which is the mass campaigns of the 1920s. So in the early development of Satyagraha, as I suggested, Gandhi used the term epiphany to describe, sometimes revelation, to describe these moments of conceptual insights, or what he would say, a, a progressive step in his thinking. They were essentially, I think, moments in which there was a sudden convergence of his spiritual and political views. 
This, these are more well known or be familiar to you, so I will only mention them briefly. 1906, of course, is a date we often think of, rightly, as the moment of Satyagraha's invention. Uh, with a new wave of immigration restrictions in, tra in the Transvaal, the Indian community faced an existential threat. Gandhi proposed what he saw as a novel form of resistance, refusing registration and courting jail going. At the famous meeting at Empire Theater in Johannesburg, this was converted into a religious vow. This was the epiphany that Gandhi experienced, that a spiritual element fundamentally transformed the political project or pursuit and mark the first real convergence of these two worlds, of his two worlds, the world of liberal politics and legal action and the world of spiritual and moral reform. Practice was invented, jail going, and then given a name and a philosophy. The epiphany produced a cascade of novel ideas, arguments and action. The term Satyagraha itself was invented and it was also this dense period in 1906, 1907, 1908, that you see the translations of Plato, Thoreau, Ruskin, and a set of articles to explain the basic logic of Satyagraha on the pages of Indian opinion. That period of intense theoretical creativity culminates in the writing of Hind Swaraj. And Hind Swaraj is, of course, another kind of epiphany written in 1909. It's sparked by the assassination of the ADC to the Secretary of State for India in London, Gandhi had to directly meet for the first time the challenge of militant violence. And with that challenge, he produced again for the first time a critique of violence. It was another convergence. His readings and thinking about the ills of industrial civilization as they dovetailed with his new political goal of rebutting the militant argument. This epiphany was that political violence was linked to the allure of modern civilization, the classic thesis of Hind Swaraj, and that modern civilization was itself the true cause of India's colonial enslavement. So now let's return to the moment of crisis I began with. Gandhi's first experiments in mass satyagraha the Rowlett campaign and non-cooperation, which were punctuated with and ultimately ended in violence. This moment, I think, is less well known in the sense that it is not usually recognized as, as theoretically significant as I think it was. As you know, the Rowlett Acts were a series of acts extending wartime emergency powers to fight sedition. For Gandhi, as in the Tranval, Laws that suspended basic civil liberties were degrading laws that no self-respecting person or nation could live under. Quote, submission to such laws is forfeiting, forfeiting one's humanity and accepting slavery. In such cases, everyone had not just a right of disobedience, but a moral duty to disobey. But Gandhi immediately faced a conundrum. It was not at all clear how one could practice satyagraha against the Rowlett bills. That is, how could one civilly disobey anti-sedition legislation? Critics like Srinivasa Sastri, as well as Annie Besant, noted that if one undertook acts of sedition as a form of disobedience, it would be in practice criminal by definition and risked confirming the very need for repressive legislation. Gandhi initially thought he could get out of this problem by suggesting that the bills so undermined the authority of the regime that one could legitimately disobey other adjacent laws, such as the salt law or revenue taxes. Eventually, he alighted on a way to undertake sedition in a nonviolent and non-threatening manner by circulating prohibited literature and issuing a newspaper without the required license. Thankfully, his own works had been uniformly banned, so he could now circulate Hind Swaraj, the, the translation or the rewriting of the Apology of Socrates, and a small pamphlet on Mustafa Pasha. Gandhi's careful deliberations here, I think, are a good demonstration of how much for Gandhi, Satyagraha at this time was almost exclusively defined as creative acts of disobedience, of collective law-breaking and jail-going. The Rowlett Satyagraha began on April 6th with a coordinated nationwide hartal, a day of work suspension, traditionally undertaken as a ritual of public mourning. It included a 24-hour fast, mass processions, often starting with a ritual bath, and also 
uh, suggestions that in villages and hamlets, meetings would take place in which resolutions against the Rowlett Acts would be passed. The next day, April 7th, civil disobedience commenced with the f uh, in this form of disseminating prohibited literature. By April 8th, Gandhi had already been called upon to put, a, put down various fires, incidents of violence and intimidation by protesters and police. The most disturbing news was coming from Delhi and the Punjab. Gandhi left for Delhi to help quell growing tensions. He was not allowed to enter, and he was escorted back to Bombay and ordered to remain in the Bombay presidency. Rumors of Gandhi's arrest and detention led to unrest in Bombay, uh, and on the spot Hartal was attempted with protesters forcibly closing shops, disrupting transport, and throwing stones at the police. In Gujarat, the violence was more severe. Here, the rumor was that Gandhi and Anusuya Sarabhai had also been arrested. In Ahmedabad, crowds attacked the collector's office, burned a jailhouse, cut telephone wires, and tried to derail trains, and worst of all, attacked and killed several Europeans. Similar incidents continued on April 12th, 11th and 12th. By then, Gandhi saw that the extent of violence was such that a drastic self-correction was necessary. On April 14th, he issued a statement in the unregistered newspaper, Satyagrahi, uh, under the title Self-Examination, where Gandhi confessed, quote, that Satyagraha is not as easy a weapon to handle, and that he had overcalculated the measure of permeation of Satyagraha amongst the people. He would now try to correct these errors by, quote, retracing my steps for the time being and now directing Satyagraha against my own countrymen, beginning with a 72-hour fast. On April 18th, Gandhi announced a temporary suspension, suspension of civil disobedience. Now the reckoning began. Gandhi's initial assessment of the violence was that knowledge of Satyagraha was still very much in its infancy. The pause was an opportunity to continue much needed propaganda on the basic logic of Satyagraha. The pedagogical campaign was front and center in a very interesting series of leaflets, 21 in total, published in April and June of 1919, and then continued in the journals that Gandhi took over and effectively turned into movement papers, Navajivan, Navajivan and Young India. At the same time, Gandhi kept looking to restart civil disobedience on a very restricted basis, but even then kept deferring it. His reasoning for the restrictions and the postponements was based on what he called a discovery, his first real insight into the causes of violence, or so he thought, of why civil disobedience had so easily devolved into criminal disobedience. In a country like India, he suggested, in which the population, elite, and mass had been cowed down by a system of arbitrary repression, laws were only followed out of fear, in which, which in Gandhi's understanding was equivalent to a deep mental lawlessness. This meant there was no real understanding and deep practice of civil obedience. In such a state, the call to disobedience, however circumscribed, could not truly be civil. This was now what Gandhi understood to be his great miscalculation, his Himalayan miscalculation. And here's a, a longish quote from Gandhi. And my error in trying to let civil disobedience take the people by storm appears to me to be Himalayan because of the discovery I have made, namely, that he only is able and attains the right to offer civil disobedience who has known how to offer voluntary and deliberate obedience to the laws of the state in which he is living. It is only after one has voluntarily obeyed such laws a thousand times that an occasion rightly comes to one, to civilly disobey certain laws. I will, if there's time, delve deeper, delve into what this idea of civil obedience meant in practice. But here I want to note that Gandhi's deep hesitation pushed him to start inventing forms of satyagraha beyond civil disobedience. Indeed, he became so wary of the term disobedience that he proposed civil resistance to be a better English term for satyagraha, for any satyagraha against unjust law. So one alternative form of satyagraha that was already starting to be practiced and advocated, but not, maybe not named openly as Satyagraha was a, a program of Swadeshi. Later, he added a kind of constructive element, working on national unity, working on Hindu-Muslim unity. These elements, as you know, will eventually be built into 
a more extensive constructive program and directly tied to a different kind of satyagraha, constructive satyagraha. The other, and in a way I think the most interesting development in this period, was the formulation of the theory and practice of non-cooperation as an alternative form of satyagraha, and also one that was meant to avoid the problems of direct disobedience. Politically, the idea of non-cooperation developed out of a separate ongoing agitation taking place alongside Rowlett, the Khilafat campaign. In fact, the program for full-blown non-cooperation was first deliberated upon and adopted by the Khilafat committee, and it was started under its auspices. It was only later endorsed by Congress in the, in the latter half of 1920. And it was only even later that the reconstituted Gandhian Congress, with a new constitution and internal structure and new creed, that would eventually take over the non-cooperation campaign as its own, and the movement then would connect these three ongoing grievances, the Rowlith, uh, the Rowlith bills, the Punjab wrongs, and the Khilafat campaign. Gandhi's thinking on non-cooperation actually began through debates on two evolving tactics. Here I want to emphasize again the deep interplay between theory and practice in the evolution of Gandhi and Satyagraha, and how in fact Gandhi often experimented and deployed a tactic, and then built theory to explain its basic logic and purpose, as he had done with the idea of jail going in South Africa. Two tactics in particular led to the development of non-cooperation. One was the Hartal, as we saw, first inaugurated with Rowlett, repeated a few times after. The Hartal would become, in a way, a signature, for, a signature Gandhian form of mobilization, often used at the start of a campaign. After Rowlett, the Hartal was used sometimes in ways that Gandhi approved, and also in many ways that he disapproved. For example, Gandhi opposed a lot of these on-the-spot Hartals that were organized when people, protesters, were arrested or jailed. That Gandhi tried to show or argue that was undermining what he thought the logic of jail going was. So you weren't supposed to protest, you should celebrate when someone gets arrested. He also imposed intimidation or compulsion used during Hartels. In his view, Hartels should be announced in advance with no compulsion or intimidation on the day itself. In fact, a true Satyagraha Hartel, he would say, would want, you would want some shops left open. Having 20, 10% of the shops left open was a sign that there was mass voluntary commitment and the strength of the movement. Gandhi used this tactic, for example, to protest the expulsion of B.G. Horniman, the editor of the Bombay Chronicle. It was used again successfully uh, in two days which were uh, uh, called roughly Kilaf, the Kilafith days. Like, these, like the earlier Harthos, these all of these Harthos were primarily days of prayer and fasting, um, but this, the second and third of the Kilafith Harthos also began to mark a kind of shift, uh, a movement towards not just um, a kind of sign of mourning or disaffection, but were recon reconfigured as actually withdrawals of cooperation. Again, in relation to Khilafat, this was a call to keep away from the peace celebrations that were uh, celebrating the end of World War I. The success of this second Hartal, the second Khilafat day, directly inspired a wider program of non-cooperation. The second tactic that laid the framework of non-cooperation was the boycott, specifically boycott of foreign cloth. Gandhi was initially very much opposed to the language of boycott, which he saw as framed too much by a logic of punishment. Interestingly, when Martin Luther King be began the Montgomery boycott, he similarly opposed the term boycott on exactly the same grounds. Um, but Gandhi agreed that if you redirected the boycott not just against English cloth, but more generally foreign cloth, it was not act of punishment, but part of the necessity for Swadeshi's constructive program. And it also could be understood and legitimated as a kind of withdrawal from participation in an unjust or evil system. So boycott became palatable to Gandhi when viewed in this new logic, the logic of non-cooperation, not as punishment or directly disrupting British trade, but as a withdrawal from cooperation 
an unjust, immoral institution. This in particular was a form of production that had directly enslaved India. So this, these two tactics and this turn be started to articulate the conceptual core of really a new justification or understanding of Satyagraha as such. Prior to this, Gandhi had argued that protest against an unjust law required disobeying the law and getting jailed. And you can see in all of the South Africa campaigns, this was the basic purpose of each tactic, whether it was refusing registration, whether it was the border raid, whether it was trading without licenses, the purpose was to get arrested. Now, unjust laws could also be contested by refusal to cooperate refusal to cooperate with an unjust system. And it was in this period that Gandhi first articulated what now theorists of nonviolence would call a pluralist social or consent theory of power. This was Gandhi's way of formulating it. In politics, Satyagraha is based on the immutable maxim that government of the people is possible only so long as they consent, either consciously or unconsciously, to be governed. No government, much less the Indian government, can subsist if people cease to serve it. So various of these kinds of formulation appear in this time. And in general, you get the strong idea of a distinct theory, a nonviolent theory of power and authority, in which the basic logic of which is that all regimes, even the most authoritarian, were based on the acquiescence and collaboration, ideological and material, of the many from below and therefore could be disrupted by mass disaffection and withdrawal from below. And I, some, some aspect of this idea is hinted at in Hind Swaraj. It's certainly, you can trace it back into Tolstoy's writings and certainly some ways in which Gandhi's reading Tolstoy. So in Hind Swaraj, the basic idea that the English have not taken India, we have given it to them. They're not in India because of their strength, but because we keep them. Uh, later, he writes also that um, they, they, the, the British will only rule as, as long as we play the part of the rules. So there are these ideas present before, but I think it's clear that it's only in this period, in the 1920s, where Gandhi really gives it a very specific and drawn out theoretical elaboration. Again, a, a kind of theory of authority, a distinct theory of authority and power. And this theory um, has a very long legacy in theories of nonviolent politics today, but I won't dwell on it because I want to come back to the question of violence. So at first, um, Gandhi was eager to emphasize the difference between non-cooperation and civil disobedience. It was, in his views, less aggressive, less not directly confrontational. It could be undertaken by school children, um, because in principle, the, uh, the basic idea of a, a withdrawal was not illegal. Uh, but the theory and practice of non-cooperation would really push it to its logical endpoint, which in fact had to, in some sense, or necessarily incorporated again the question of civil disobedience. So even when the fourfold program of non-cooperation is announced, the, you'd be familiar with them. The first one was giving up titles and honorary posts. The second was um, uh, boycotting um, government schools, institutions of the courts, uh, courts and civil offices if possible. And then there were these third and fourth, what he called distant, very distant goals, which were uh, resigning from the police and military, and finally, the most remote, the suspension of taxes. So when non-cooperation is first announced, um, there is some sense that you, the first two, which are pure non-cooperation that don't require civil disobedience, were the main focus. And at the long, at the end point, there might be a moment in which non-cooperation had to necessarily incorporate total disobedience. Um, but it, it is, I think, very interesting that as the campaign actually progressed, as the logic of successful mobilization pushed the movement itself to reckon directly with civil disobedience again. So as the mobilization was at its peak in the early, in the late 19, late 1921, the government started arresting leaders and especially banning meetings, uh, especially after the a very successful tactic of having bonfires of foreign cloths and demonstrations at all of the places where the Prince of Wales was visiting. 
um, that boycott. So those, um, so Gandhi, so Gandhi, in the face of that sort of government, in the face of government crackdown, Gandhi relented on civil disobedience and said that under such conditions, a defensive civil disobedience was necessary, even a duty. The Rowlett, so this, so defensive disobedience was, in his logic, akin to self-defense. It was necessary and automatic response to laws that violate fundamental moral and political principles or undermine your identity as an agent. So the Rowlett laws would fit into this, the Transvaal laws would fit into this. This was now contrasted to what he called aggressive civil disobedience, where you contest a law as a way to question the authority of the regime its authority to issue, issue laws, for example, the non-payment of taxes. So as non-cooperation continued, Gandhi also started contemplating the need, was pushed in a way by the mobilization and his supporters to contemplate escalating the campaign to aggressive civil disobedience. So defensive, defensive civil disobedience was allowed. And again, aggressive civil disobedience, the real difference is you, it's contesting a whole system but it's, you know, uh, I think one way to think of the difference is that uh, in this case, Gandhi was thinking, contemplating, escalating to the non-payment of taxes. In, in, in Non-payment of taxes, in Gandhi's understanding, was not in and of itself an immoral law, whereas the Rowlett Acts, the Transvaal, were in and of itself an assault tax, immoral or unjust. But when you actually voluntarily decide to disobey a law that in principle isn't immoral, but you're disobeying it because of the unjustness of the regime, you're making a much broader judgment on the system as a whole, and therefore it's a more expanded critique. And as you would say, provocative, voluntary, that's what makes it aggressive. So indeed, the late, later stages of non-cooperation were by definition aggressive civil disobedience. Again, fi Gandhi finally took the step to announce non-payment of revenue taxes to start in, the, in one exemplary dis district, Bardoli. But uh, as you may know, it was precisely in the week that the Bardoli campaign uh, of civil disobedience was meant to begin that the events at Chari Chora brought the entire campaign to an end. So here we come back to the question of violence. So for Gandhi, Chari Chara was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was a final instance a, a, in a cumulative series of mistakes which Gandhi had dismissed or he said ignored warnings of various incidents of violence from the relatively mild form of fisticuffs at political meetings to acts of social boycott and um, ostracism to isolated physical assaults to finally the murder of constables at Chari Chara. So here was a real moment, another drastic Himalayan miscalculation, an even more drastic suspension, and an important conceptual discovery. Gandhi now saw these events as linked together and re revealing some persistent and unstable core at the heart of mass satyagraha. Slowly, Gandhi came to see that the causes of violence were deeper and more internal to the psychology of mass action. The ever-present temptation of power, efficacy, and mastery, which in turn meant that internal constraints in terms of the forms and rules of satyagraha needed to be insisted on. So here I'll just go through the progression of his thinking or his diagnosis. So as I said, suggested earlier, he initially thought that the violence that emerged uh, after Rowlett was in a way a product of ignorance. One, that was one thesis, that knowledge of and training in Satyagraha was very limited as it was new, to, uh, new and that propaganda for it had just beginning. And this was why in that first discovery he had seen that disobedience, the term, while it was meant to lead to assertiveness, was actually also leading to lawlessness or illegality. Another ex explanation relied on the thesis of Hind Swaraj, that misunderstanding and impatience were a product of the lingering effects of Western education and Western civilization. Um, in, the, in some ways, both of these explanations allowed a kind of um, an allowed an expectation that over time 
the violence would decline. But in fact, both of, even though Gandhi moves to a third explanation, which I'll come to, some version of these explanations continue throughout his campaigns. So there's always a question in Gandhi's, uh, de the way he writes, the way he reflects, that he always is struggling with a kind of basic misunderstanding, he thinks, people have of satyagraha, that there are just some people who always believe that the best way to perform satyagraha is mixing violence and nonviolence, and that that would be a better and more effective form of provocation. Gandhi would always insist that mis this misunderstood the logic of satyagraha, it mixed opposite psychological tendencies, but he also recognized that it was a common way of practicing and understanding satyagraha. Secondly, the question of violence as an elite pathology, Gandhi would continue, he didn't ever, he would continue to think it played some role. So he did think the educated elite, sometimes he would say the half-educated, were easily seduced to violence, driven by frustrated power or a desire for power. And, and in Hind Swaraj, he began discussing certain psychological traits that he thought undergirded the turn to political violence. And again, they were associated most, more with elite activity. So again, the idea of um, mastery due to frustration, which was really the sort of thesis of the famous example in the middle of Hind Swaraj around the, um, the thief. Um, and also when he's, when he starts accounting for some of the incidents in Gujarat in, after the Rowlet Act and in Chori Chora, he really tries to focus on the idea that those who were undertaking violence in both those incidents were Congress volunteers in the case of Chori Chora, or he would say, people who were organizing elements. And so he constantly was trying to differentiate some of this violence from a kind of spontaneous mob violence. Secondly, so, but I think the more important thesis that comes out of that is a kind of sense that there is a moral psychology or a temptation of power from a sense of frustration or frustrated power. But Chari Chara had, I think, the deepest and distinct diagnosis a kind of violence that emerged from within the dynamics of mass action was internal, the move, internal to the movement and one that had to constantly be mitigated but couldn't be ever totally resolved. And here I would say his discovery was the discovery of collective power. In his words, what he had discovered was that protesters, quote, liked and loved excitement and underneath these vast demonstrations was an idea unconsciously lurking in the breast that it was a kind of demonstration of force, the very negation of nonviolence. So here, the excitement of action was linked to the emergence of collective power and the strength of acting in numbers. Indians were overcoming slavery uh, and regaining agency, but at the same time reveling in a newly found power by intimidating others seen as weaker to them, especially weaker in numbers. And there are a number of different incidents before Chari Chara where he talks about the ways in which the idea of numbers really um, has this distorting sense of, of, of power. So in an, in, again, in the, in the analysis of Rowlett, we had this worry about um, assertiveness or agency turning into lawlessness. And now I think you have a very specific characterization of a worry that power as agency can easily become a power, can be experienced and um, practiced as power as mastery. Um, so this, I think, when Gandhi reflected on non-cooperation, after his release many years later, he would say it was a success, non-cooperation was a success in that it overcame what he thought Indians were, um, the fear that Indians were bound to, fear of, of, of government authority. But the anxiety was that overcoming the fear had unconsciously turned into a kind of demonstration of power. And this, I think, was a deep and abiding paradox of mass satyagraha, and also a deep insight that Gandhi did make the analogy with, with mass democracy itself. The collective, collective power as agency, as acting with others, is always in danger of transmuting into the assertion of power as mastery acting over others. And the power of numbers that so potently is meant to express mass dissent against regimes of power 
uh, always risks turning into majoritarian displays of power when directed against fellow citizens. So you have a two-sidedness in mass protest. Gandhi continued to worry about this throughout the 20s. Again, I think some of his most powerful statements are in the mid-20s when he thinks about how you describe or define Swaraj as, um, as a democratic power. Um, so I think one of the insights of this period is exactly this, that Gandhi was acutely aware of these dangers in the development of Satyagraha. He continually searched uh, for forms and rules of action that could slow, um, a kind of slow and silent staging of discipline and individuality, for example, that could temper the psychology of frustrated action and collective power. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna just come to some quick conclusions so we can open up the floor to questions. I think, um, and I've, I think to me, so, so to my mind, the crucial theoretical revelation was that violence was not a product of ignorance or civilization, but internal and an ever-present feature of mass satyagraha. Likewise, it meant that Gandhi really shifted what the purpose of satyagraha was. In his early days, satyagraha was understood as an alternative to violence in politics. It was also understood as a way to wean the violent from the path of politics. And now I think you really have a sense that Satyagraha had to mitigate and counter violence that itself might generate. And to navigate this fine line, both expanding and refining the repertoire of Satyagraha, Gandhi um, had to try to mitigate violence through the formal structures of Satyagraha as action. So I won't say more about this, but happy to discuss it. But I think this is where you see why this period, the idea that Satyagraha has to be, a, what he says, a self-limiting form of action in his, this is a quote from Satyagraha in South Africa, where he says, Satyagraha has to be a force that contains within itself seeds of progressive self-restraint. And the key mechanism was something like tapasya or disciplined suffering that is uh, performed and dramatized. And I think this is why you see, again, an eruption of rules, definitions, specifications. What differentiates criminal from civil disobedience? What makes a boycott or hartal nonviolent? Uh, and nonviolence in that way does become, I think, becomes a mode of um, demanding self-correction. It also meant that Gandhi's definition of nonviolence was very demanding. It wasn't just about avoiding violence. Um, so lastly, uh, and I think maybe, let me see. The last, I think, legacy I would say is, one of the things, of course, I think is still admirable in Gandhi is that unlike many of the thinkers that he most admired, you can think of Tagore, but also in some ways Tolstoy and others, he was someone who was uh, critical or aware of the problems of mass democracy and mass politics, but always tried to turn to it or change it or refine it rather than turn away from mass politics. And finally, I think in the legacies for today, there is a tendency to treat uh, mass protest as a kind of free-for-all, that it really is about uh, the largest number of people you can bring out. And I think one of the things that the legacy or the tradition of nonviolence was trying to argue was that it's not as much about, it's not, it's not only numbers that matters, but it's how you stage, how you carefully and precisely dramatize both the power and the way in which that power is limited. And you do that in the form or in the performance of protest itself. And I'll end there. Uh, thank you, ma'am. That was a very insightful lecture. Um, my question is, how did the realization that violence is uh, internal to the very act of mass politics itself uh, influence the praxis of uh, Gandhi, uh, praxis of mass movement that Gandhi enacted afterwards? Yes. <laughs> what did change in the practice? It's a, it's a big question and um, an important one. And actually, much of what I'm writing is on that question. So I think I would say um, two things is just picking up on two of the many um, problems that Gandhi noticed here. So one, he it was really after Rowlett that he insisted on the civility of disobedience. And as you may know, that's a very specific Gandhian formulation. Thoreau used the term civil disobedience 
really just to refer to the object that you disobey, the civil state. But Gandhi really made it after Rowlett and after the question of violence, the idea that there is a, um, a comportment, a way you civilly disobey. And I, I'll just give one example. So one of the ways he would do that is in order to civilly obey, you or to show that you are civilly disobeying, as he said, you have a right to civilly disobey once you also show that you are obedient or law abiding. And I think that wasn't a rule of who has the right to disobey. It was really a sense of who would um, accept you as a convincing disobedient. How do you show someone, the public at large, your opponent, that you're law abiding in the moment that you're disobeying? And one of the things I think Gandhi insisted on was a general formality to protest. You follow rules, you do exactly what you say you're going to do. But I think the other, especially in Rowlett, was the idea of a pledge or a vow. So if you take a pledge or a vow, you are becoming a kind of restrained lawmaker. And part of the pledge is to disobey without and protect people and property. So I think one way, one of the praxis, there are many, but I think a lot of the rules that Gandhi gives on how to do a hartel, how to do a boycott, were precisely about the praxis that slows down the psychological frustration uh, temptation of power. The other, I think, especially after Chari Chara, which would be interesting because that's specifically about collective, the idea of collective power. And I think there, there is something interesting where you see in, in especially obviously the salt satyagraha is the main moment where you see all of these new ideas coming into form or really being successful is I think Gandhi tries to in, insert individuality within a collective form. So some of that again is by making people take um, individual vows and also acting as individuals even when they are in a collective moment. I think silence is one of it, but also probably the best model of it is also Kadi. You know, Kadi is something that is a mass practice that everyone is supposed to do, but when you do it, you are radically isolating yourself. It's especially the opposite of um, a kind of aggregation that a lot of collective action has. Gandhi is really against kind of aggregation of sentiment. So at the largest public demonstrations, Gandhi almost always insisted on silence. It was, and, and speeches were meant to, again, just be simple and straightforward and not incite passion. So I think those are some, but I think you could really follow a lot of the um, rules of action, very much to come back to this question of, of I think within it we can think of, um, it, they're really guided by the idea of self-restraint or staging discipline. And I think they have more, they both mitigate violence on the one hand, but they're also, the second part of it, which I didn't discuss, is it's also tied to a theory that he's slowly developing that with the mitigation is also one in which others will hear your argument better. So it also will have a, it's more true to the purpose of satyagraha in that way. So it's not just a negative argument, there's a, a positive side to it too. Thank you so much for your talk, Professor. Um, so you talked about how um, Gandhi thought that there couldn't be any civil disobedience because um, Indians followed rules not out of civic duty, but out of fear. Um, but isn't the entire basis of civil disobedience that the social contract of the col colonial regime um, is based on a lie? It doesn't exist. And this is why um, there is no civil duty, because there is no consens consensus between the ruled and ruler, right? Um, so why then does he... Um, why does why didn't the, does he say some rules have to be followed? Just the fact that he called off the civil disobedience, disobedience movement means that uh, he doesn't see it as a form of a general ethics, but a specific political um, action. Um, so why, is, why does he advocate for self-limiting action? So in general, I think, yeah, that's a really important point. In general, I think, well, two things. I think Gandhi doesn't actually believe in state legitimacy in that way, that you have a, I think it would be hard to say you have a fully moral duty to follow a law, meaning a moral duty to the state. I think Gandhi doesn't believe that. He believes though, and in this context, when he was writing this specific, this period when he is really trying to struggle with that question of 
Obviously, as I say, what he was trying to do was avoid violence. That was more important to him. But what he said in that quote that I started to read is that, you know, he himself, he wanted Indians to get to a point where they didn't follow a law out of fear. And he said that he himself had never followed a law out of fear um, or duty. But he would say he did think that uh, as a practical matter, as a citizen of South Africa, of India or London, he would say it's an ordinary duty, a kind of practical duty that if a law isn't objectionable or immoral, you would just follow it. That's that's not a duty as such. It's more like a citizenly duty. It's it's less a moral a moral duty. You do have duties to yourself. So if a law is unjust, like the Rowlith, you do have a duty to disobey. But I think he would say on both grounds, but he would say in order to actually have an effective protest to show that you are a law-abiding citizen, not a, he would say not a criminal disobedient who breaks the law and hides, or an anarchist who breaks the law because they don't believe in any law. If you want the government to see you as a partner, a, a kind of constitutional form of protest that you're asking for grievances to be heard and you're actually arguing for a major reform, then you have to show yourself to be a law-abiding citizen. So I think th that's the sort of set of practical ideas. Um, and I think he really did think, and he did obviously by the time of um, by the time of non-cooperation, he really did think the regime itself didn't have the authority to, so all laws were unjust because the regime was unjust. He had gotten to that point, but I think he also thought that if India was going to build an alternative government, it is, the power is in the people. So in the end, you should show this alternative way of obeying law. Like in, Indians did need to learn how to obey laws not out of fear. And the best way to do that is to build our own laws, give laws to ourselves. So that is also a way in which some of these large campaigns, I think the idea of you know following a vow is giving a law to oneself in that way too. So I think, but I think, so I think in some ways the moral duty to disobey doesn't, and the question of how you disobey. And a lot of Satyagraha and a lot of what Gandhi is interested in is the how, how you do that and how you present it and how you make that act um, uh, act um, work. And I think any amount of violence he thinks undermines the, the clarity and the moral clarity of, of disobedience. And in the long run, he very rarely, except for the salt Satyagraha, really practices mass disobedience. Salt Satyagraha is really almost the only case of successful mass civil disobedience in the campaign. And it really becomes, I think, less important than the larger project of non-cooperation, which continues because it, can, it doesn't have to be called off, the idea of withdrawal, and constructive Satyagraha, which also doesn't have to be called off. It's, these are both kind of persistent forms of Satyagraha. Uh, so I have two... Uh quite general questions uh, which my political science friends may not be may not get particularly excited about <laughs> uh, so uh, first question is uh, since the time gandhi started writing advocating his ideas working practicing there there have been group of admirers followers and there has there have been groups of critiques uh, and it's and Till now, till today, we have different forms of protest, different forms of mass protests. Every day, new forms of protests mm -hmm. also emerging. I mean, right now, as we sit here, there are there is a protest going on mm -hmm. yeah. uh, around the world. So, but we see that t even now we we are keep we keep going back uh, and uh, investigate and uh, Gandhi Satyagraha. Uh, so I just wanted to understand what is this uh, uh, interest or how important do uh, uh, are people feeling uh, towards this uh, theorizing uh, Gandhi's uh, uh, Satyagraha or practices, mm -hmm. uh, whatever range of practices that he has come up with in his yeah. life. That's the first part. Uh, the second part is is on Satyagraha, and if if I do a kind of uh, 
deconstruction of satyagraha in uh, I, i mean i could be wrong please correct me in the answer uh, it, it, in some ways that a quest for truth which will lead to swaraj or badly translated as self rule uh, so is there a com- you have complicated the word boycott in your uh, presentation also complicated satyagraha which may be a combination of violence and non violence so is there a complication of self in self rule that who is this self and why why do i not see uh, does self means emancipation for all or there is no address of emancipation in this self rule Yes, excellent. Um I would say, you know, I think what one thing is very interesting about the debate on Gandhi uh in India and abroad is actually I think in India it because Gandhi and Gandhi and ideology, as you say Gandhi has many critics. Almost everyone he interacted with became, <laughs> became groups of critics. And clearly now, especially we live in a moment where I don't think there's a really potent Gandhian movement of any kind but i think in india criticism of gandhi the debate about gandhi partially because he is such an overwhelming figure he commented was involved in all of the major questions of uh of indian independence or decolonization from nationalism to religion to caste everywhere so i think actually in the debate on gandhi in india is really about what gandhi represents gandhi and ideology is he a defender or a critic of caste is he a um hindu nationalist or a critic of hinduism that's where the fault lines are and have been since gandhi's time amongst marxists ambedkarites hindu nationalists but i think what's interesting is actually within all of that in india there was very little um either scholarly or political engagement with the theory and practice of satyagraha gandhi was very precise as i try to say most of the time people were so objecting to other parts of the ideology they often thought satyagraha was a lot of sophistry that none of these rules and principles had a coherence and very little work in his own time or after on extricating its logic but interestingly when satyagraha was adopted or adapted and taken up by african americans in the us or in england um you the focus was exactly the opposite people didn't think about gandhian ideology they just focused on the strategic logic of nonviolence what it was how it can be used does it require religion what is the massness what's the theory of boycott and you ended up in america by the end of the 60s with theories of nonviolence that really emphasized strategic the strategic necessity of nonviolence and collective protest so for my but i think it, in the long term our contemporary language both in india and the west that think about how to do mass protest has very little um conceptualization and um thinking about why one form of protest differs from another we have almost always and the strategic theories of mass protest too really have just ended up relying on numbers and just thinking about large numbers being disruptive in some form or coming out and in fact we don't even have a definition of civil disobedience that's anything other than the an equivalent for mass protest so i i actually think um I think I, I think the uh utility is Gandhi, I think King, there are others were genuine um theorists and practitioners of a distinct form of protest, a distinct form of mass politics that continues to shape uh our political lives and we should refer to not just them but the activists and others who were involved in many of these protests who theorized their action and to learn from them to make our practices of mass protest more efficacious and um and also have some inbuilt and important interesting ethical issues so i actually i understand entirely the idea that why do we have to keep talking about gandhi all the time i completely understand that but i think one practically activists have taken up satyagraha so there is something to that logic that i think and i think the uh, civil rights movement in america was a very authentic adoption the very similar ideas transferring through so i think it's less to me about recovering gandhi as much as saying if we take the practice to be interesting and important and really there's no one else who theorizes mass protest to the same degree to the same 
pertinent and with practical experience. It's very hard to find. So I think actually to me, recovering this longer history, not just Gandhi, is also coming up with an, a really important tradition of thinking and practice, as important, I think, as Marxist thinking, think, thinkers and practitioners, but we don't tend to see this as a philosophical, political, coherent I, I, school of ideas that we can turn to, that we can criticize, that we can innovate from. Um, all of that means I've partially forgotten the second <laughs> self. Yes. Um, I mean, I think it's, I actually do think Gandhi in this period, whether he failed is a different question, but he is committed to mass politics and the incorporation of everyone in the project of Satyagraha and self-rule. So in 1924, when he comes out of jail and he's the uh, president of Congress, he really tries to institute what he called a transformation of Congress to um, you know, lower, you know, to make the ordinary Indians the centerpiece of politics in the Congress Party, and he really, you know, the project of Kadi and the Kadi franchise was, as he said, to make every Indian, the ordinary Indian, be participate in their own, in this project of becoming free. So I, I think actually that should be the starting point. You can criticize where he failed and under what guise it didn't work, but I don't actually think it's a question of intention. He genuinely did think that m the reason Satyagraha had to be mass politics was because each ordinary Indian had to participate and be responsible for their own emancipation. It was always a theory of self-emancipation. No one could emancipate yourself. That is what the self in self-rule really was about too. Uh, nice to have you here, uh, Professor Matena, uh, speaking to us uh, in person on our campus. Thank you. No, actually, uh, you know, I think what your presentation poses for us is about theorizing from contextual determinations, right? And I think I'm, I'm not, uh, of course, this p question of theorizing from contextual determinations can be raised at our uh, scholarly levels, but I think you're also posing the question of theorizing at contextual determinations at the first instance itself, at the first order level. So Gandhi is, uh, is theorizing uh, from the determinations that, it, in a manner of speaking, ground this practice. Mm -hmm, yeah. So I quite agree with uh, the point that you said that there is something experimental in what he's doing. Uh, 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 but somewhere along the way, I think it's also important that how is this experimental orientation coming to terms with the demands of its own ethos? And, mm -hmm. and, and because somewhere along the way, even as we talk about these uh, uh, contextual determinations in the theory and practice of Satyagraha at the first order level itself, I think there is also a certain, um, you know, ethos in which uh, this experimentation uh, uh, proceeds. It entails an ethos, it also presupposes an ethos, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, and so on. So, And I think that ethos which it presupposes as indeed entails has its own deep constraints, as it were, right? So. So I was asking, how much does the experimental orientation, which I think we are reading into Gandhi as a political theorist, meet with the demands uh, that that ethos itself opens up? Now, is right. there, I mean, is there a, a certain line that we can be pushing about the theory and practice of, of Gandhi and Satyagraha uh, in that light? Yes, I, if I understand, I th I think I think you're right. Um, you know, the there is. I mean, I think some of it at the individual level. This is a kind of core problem, a kind of contradiction, maybe, or a kind of always a tension in the idea of um, self emancipation too. In some ways, the ethos, as you as you say, you know. Um, there's always a way in which satyagraha is supposed to be performed in the right spirit. And the question is, does the right spirit come before the performance or after? And this problem is, um, becomes exponential when you think in mass terms. And I don't know if that, I can, I can get to that and maybe get 
and so I, I think Gandhi doesn't, I think he struggles with it. And I think it, I think you're right that some of the answers he gives, it's, it's, it's unclear if they're exactly experimental in that way, because I think the core idea of experiment is a, is akin to some of the Victorian radicalist ideas, as well as some of the Hindu ideas in which a moral ideal is only exists as truth if one originally experiments on it, you know, in one's person, in one's way of living. Unless you live an ideal, it doesn't, it's not one you can recommend to anyone else unless you prove it through experiments. That's vegetarianism of some kind. But I think when, when Gandhi's scaling up, the, the real problem in a way is, is the critics, um, you know, he has three sets of critics, eventually Marxist critics, but he has liberal critics, and he also has critics of his, from his own side who are very worried that the individual capacity to experiment, the individuality, will be crushed by rules coming from above. So for example, this Rowlett campaign, right from the beginning, you know, they say you can only disobey this way. He said, but why are you constraining people's capacity to disobey? And I, I think this, I don't know, I, I think Gandhi hesitates constantly on the nature of a rule that's imposed from without. But I, I also think that one of the things he does come to is that um, he says often the difference between satyagraha as a policy versus satyagraha as a creed obviously is that those who, and, and you know, Martin Luther King had a very similar distinction. There are those who follow Satyagraha as a creed because they believe in it, they have inner motivation, and they see it as an experiment on their self, their capacity to follow these rules, to discipline, self-restraint, etc. Others, he thinks, he doesn't think everyone will necessarily believe this, as you say, before they participate, but he does think if you are willing to follow the rules, it also means you're willing to follow the forms in which Satyagraha takes. And those forms, because they are say Kadi or fasting, are they're mimicking the self-practice, whether you believe in it or not. So at some point there's also a sense that if you keep practicing it, the comportment <laughs> may come to it as well. So I'm not, I don't know if I'm getting the full sense of the constraint, but I do think there are times where Gandhi is, it's a different, it's, it's actually, you know, the difference between King and Gandhi might in some way be that King's theology is still about motivation and Gandhi's isn't entirely. There is a way in which the practices can, uh, the form can form it, can inform or make the form, um, yeah. Thank you so much. It was uh, it was a very interesting uh, take on the idea of uh, Satyagraha. Um, I mean, I was just thinking based on what you were referring to about how the idea of Satyagraha itself has an idea of violence that is embedded in it. So, but that violence in terms of um, the othering, where there could be a wild performance of Satyagraha, the uh, one could. Uh, con uh, inflict violence on others but I think uh, in I mean even listening to you and rethinking about the idea of Satyagraha I think somewhere the idea of violence is itself structurally embedded within the idea of Satyagraha itself because it is very violent on one's own self where you render yourself vulnerable uh, without uh, without thinking of the larger structures which are not as uh, receptive or sensitive to your own vulnerability. So at the end, you are making your own self as extremely vulnerable, which in one way is being violent towards your own self, your own body. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, just... Uh, um, I mean, I may agree with you in some ways. I, I don't think Gandhi would because I think Gandhi thought exactly the opposite, that in some way, you know, work making yourself... Um, he didn't think you were making yourself vulnerable. He thought you were overcoming fear uh, and making yourself fearless. And obviously in his, um, I think in his uh, ontology or maybe even moral commitment, he did think that the body was not, you know, um, your soul was what was important to be free. So um, being able to put your body on the line was a sign of you of not vulnerability, it was the transition from passivity to activity. So I think for him, it was exactly trying to solve the problem of feeling powerless, is to put yourself to risk um, to the to the uh, anthmoth. And but I um, 
So I, I don't think in his thinking, uh, viol it could ever be understood as violence to the body. Obviously, I think many people accuse, you know, uh, all of these as there, there could be a kind of masochistic element. I think there could be, and there could be if you think more in psychologically, but the actual, most of the structures that Gandhi was um, anticipating and recommending were, um, you know, uh, risking one's life, but you, most of the time he wasn't recommending, he rarely recommended, fa he d in fact, always didn't recommend fast everyone to fast or bring to death fast unto death wasn't a mass practice. So um, I don't, and in fact, if you see both King and Gandhi, except for the famous campaigns where people really are, really violent confrontations are at stake, I don't think they expected or wanted most campaigns to work by, by staging physical violence or suffering in a kind of salacious and extreme way. Most of the campaigns were much more about demonstrating continuous long-term discipline the Montgomery boycott, 350 days. You don't need violence to be successful. So I think that's actually a misread, a, a genuine and strong misreading that both scholars and activists have of the logic of nonviolence. It has to work by receiving violence. I don't think that's actually the case, but I know many other people do. <laughs> so. Mom, um, I want you to draw attention on the INA trials. Uh, because that kind of hit the traditional bulwark of the colonial rule in India when the army and the navy arose in protest against the British rule. And in many ways, that chapter, I feel, is very sidelined because, because that, that also played a very decisive role in driving the British out of the country and maybe the trajectory of our freedom, the way we got it, would have also been different. Uh, Connected to that is my question that are there certain contexts where violence has moral legitimacy? Not by the state in terms of protesting against an authority, any authority. Are there certain situations where violence is needed and is justified and has moral currency? Or are all forms of violence except done by the state, are bad, illegitimate. Um, I mean, I, I'll only answer, I again will answer from the, the Gandhian theory. I mean, I think actually the INA, you know, obviously if you, you know, non-cooperation, the end, the third point was about mutiny, you know, so it was envisioned as part of the uh, program of Swaraj and so, you know the and so I don't I don't think it's in nest but I think the question about the INA is closer connected to your second question which is whether there is a different kind of Swaraj that comes through violence that's a deep old Fanonian <laughs> and question and I think um, that's a bigger question than I think I can answer right now I I think one thing I would say is you know well I I will try to answer one part of it so Gandhi himself as I was sort of trying to say Gandhi didn't think the state had a right to violence. So no no violence from the state was legitimate. I don't I think actually he didn't think the state was a moral actor and everything it did was a kind of violence. Um, I think there's a little bit of lang there's a kind of language difficulty because Gandhi used the term violence not analytically but normatively. So anything he called violence was something that he thought he morally criticized whether it was legitimate or not. But I also think the main point of both King and Gandhi was they did think certain types of violence were morally legitimate from an individual's perspective. Self-defense of some kind and protection of innocent if it's authentically done. But they both thought, I think Gandhi was even clearer that those kinds of defenses often are slippery and they often move to a larger justification. So the we that is justifying and defending ourselves can start incorporating others and can be an argument for imperialism, et cetera. But more importantly, both of them thought it, the question of nonviolence isn't about the moral legitimacy of violence. Their argument was that there may be individual instances where there's no other morally superior answer. In fact, as we know, Gandhi had a moral calculus where nonviolence was the most um, admired, violence was ne second, and cowardice or running away was third. So there was moral admiration 
toward the ability to overcome fear, which is involved in violence. But both Gandhi and King said that n practically there is no policy. There is no, um, you can't build a political program on violence, that it will undermine itself, that it will alienate, and it will leave psychological scars. So they genuinely didn't think that progressive reform um, structural, radical, progressive reform could ever be fully articulated or achieved through violence. That was their real claim. And one can argue whether it is true or not and give instances, but I think their argument isn't really about which forms of violence are legitimate or not. That's not where they spend a lot of time arguing. They want to show that f you can achieve political goals through nonviolence and you can achieve them better than violence, which in, in, in the examples they would give undermines progress. But the, I left the bigger question about examples. Many people have theorized and thought through how you can build um, new, you know, new, new civilizations through violence, but I think it's still not a settled fact that in fact it's possible. Yeah, thank you so much. May I request Anaga Ingoli to deliver a vote of thanks. <laughs> I would like to uh, begin by thanking, uh, on behalf of the School of Social Sciences, uh, Professor Jyotirmay Sharma, Dean uh, of the School of Social Sciences, for his uh, untiring efforts and energy in putting together this uh, great constellation of ideas and the series of lectures. I must also thank uh, the IOE for collaborating with uh, the School of Social Sciences for uh, uh, you know, organizing this uh, lecture series. I also want to thank Professor uh, Kailash, who is the head of the Department of Political Science, uh, for chairing the session and for conducting uh, the proceedings of uh, this event. I must also thank uh, the speaker for uh, sharing her apt characterization and analysis of the concept of civil, dis uh, civil disobedience and uh, the family of notions around it. Uh, I, of course, want to thank uh, the audience for their engaging questions. Uh, I would also request all of you to join me in thanking our uh, group of students and volunteers uh, who have brought meticulous care and attention in uh, every aspect of uh, organizing and carrying out these events. Dushan, Ganeshwar, Prithvi, Rajat, Haukip, Chiangmong, and Shatyaki, I hope I'm, and Suraj, I'm not missing out anyone. Uh, I think we must also thank the office and staff of uh, the Dean of the School of Social Sciences and the Department of Political Science and the staff of, of the C.V. Raman Auditorium. So with that, uh, I think I'll end the vote of thanks. Thank you.